Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Gray Art Museum, my name is Leah Sweet. I am the Head of Education and Programs at the Gray. This evening's roundtable was conceived in conjunction with Americans in Paris, artists working in post-war France, the Gray's inaugural exhibition in our new home at 18 Cooper Square. After 50 years as the Gray Art Gallery, with the move, we also transformed into the Gray Art Museum, a new name that expresses the Gray's role as a university museum with scholarly exhibitions and publications, and that stewards and interprets the NYU art collection. The exhibition Americans in Paris focuses on artists from the United States who moved to Paris between 1946 and 1962 and stayed at least a year. While the US art scene was dominated by the rise of abstract expressionism, Americans working in Paris experimented with a range of formal strategies and various approaches to both abstraction and figuration. And as the esteemed writer James Baldwin, a longtime French resident saliently observed, living in Paris afforded expats the opportunity to question what it meant to be an American artist at mid-century. The exhibition is open until July 20th, and we hope you'll stop by to see it. A few thank yous before we begin to our speakers, to the IFA for hosting this event, and to our co-sponsors, the Center for the Humanities at NYU and NYU's Remark Institute. And a very special thanks to the organizer and moderator of tonight's roundtable, Bria Patterson-West, who is a doctoral candidate at the IFA and the Gray's current graduate curatorial assistant. With knowledge, hard work, and creativity, Bria not only created this event, she contributed to Americans in Paris as an exhibition and has helped shape how the Gray shares this exhibition with its audiences as well. So with that, please join me in welcoming Bria Patterson West. Thank you so much, Leah, for that introduction. Um, and thank you also for your help in making this event happen. Um, I'm not sure if, Professor Slipkin, if you'd like to say a few words before we begin. Um, I wanna take a minute to introduce the round table um, very briefly before we begin the conversation. Um, but as the Director of Graduate Studies here at the Institute, it is customary for um, the Institute to, to say a few words before we begin. Um, so without further ado. Thanks so much. And I don't want to take any time. I just wanted to welcome you all. And as a Director of Graduate Studies in the place of um, Chris Poggi, the Director of the Institute, who couldn't be here tonight, to welcome you all. and. Um, just reiterate Leah's comments about um, this event and this partnership and how happy we are to have the speakers and I'll give it back to Brian, thanks. Thank you. So um, here we have some installation shots of our exhibition at the Gray, which I encourage you all to go see uh, before it closes in July. Americans in Paris, Artists Working in Post-War France, 1946 to 1962, is an exhibition that investigates many of the complex undercurrents that shape the trajectory of abstract painting and sculpture in the last half of the 20th century. In this landmark exhibition, competing artistic discourses, locales, and modes of production are presented together to elucidate the full picture of post-war abstraction. The contemporary critical writings of Clement Greenberg and George Matthew, for example, the abstract experiments of American expatriate and French contemporary artists, alongside the driving ideologies of self-exile and existential dread, all collectively shine a light on the contradictory frameworks that contributed to the radical shifts in aesthetic trends in the post-war period, largely towards abstraction. In my time assisting curators Deborah Balkin and Lynn Gumpert 
on the installation of our exhibition throughout the fall, I began to think about this art historical moment and weighing the renewed interest in transnational and global histories of art against the research that I am personally invested in, ranging from African-American artists working throughout the 20th and early 21st century to various understandings of diaspora and philosophies of racialization and aesthetics. Americans in Paris became an eye-opening case study, which reinforced the precarity of easily digestible racial categorization and highlighted the fallibility of art historical methodologies that rest solely on such identification. The exhibition includes the work of several African-American artists, including Emile Cadu, Barbara Chase Rabaud, Ed Clark, Harold Cousins, Beaufort Delaney, Herbert Gentry, Larry Potter, Haywood Bill Rivers, Bob Thompson, and Melvin Van Peebles, all of whom settled in France for, for a variety of reasons in the post-war period. And yet their intimate encounters with the City of Light culminated and inventive experiments with abstract modes of production that would significantly impact the trajectory of, F of American abstraction. Importantly, Black expatriate artists in post-war France were making a long established voyage initiated by earlier generations of Black cultural producers. As early as the 19th century, Black American artists traveled to Paris to receive formal art education and to remove themselves from the discriminatory violence they faced in the United States. In 1891, painter Henry Osa Osawa Tanner, for example, traveled to Paris and began studying under French masters Constant and Laurent at the Académie Julien. Long before there was a populist Black American presence in Paris, it can be said that Tanner's work was influenced by a growing consciousness of his own racial identity. During a trip to the United States in 1893, Tanner not only painted sentimental genre scenes of Black Southern life, such as the banjo lesson, he also delivered a paper entitled The American Negro in Art at the World's Congress on Africa in Chicago. Over the years, Tanner was joined by a significant cohort of 20th century Black American artists, such as sculptors Elizabeth Prophet and Augusta Savage, and painters Palmer Hayden, Hale Woodruff, Archibald J. Motley, and Albert Alexander Smith. W.E.B. Dubois, the prominent civil rights activist and author, also spent time in Paris during the 1920s. He used the city as a base for his work on the Pan-African Congress. But perhaps the most famous African-Americans to call Paris home arrived a bit later the lauded performer and actress Josephine Baker, and the illustrious writer and thinker James Baldwin. Entertainer and, individual, and eventual civil rights activist Josephine Baker was just 19 when she left the United States and began dazzling Parisian crowds in 1925. Baldwin was 24 when he arrived in Paris in 1948 with only $40 in his pocket. The 20 year space between their respective arrivals in Paris, between the so-called jazz A's age through World War II would solidify Paris as a bustling nexus of post-war avant-garde culture, particularly for Black Americans and others of African descent hailing from France's colonial territories. This was aided by a real estate magnate, William Harmon, who established the Harmon Foundation in the early 1920s, which helped many aspiring African-American artists exhibit work and provided travel fellowships for study in Paris. In 1937, Lois M. Jones was among the artists who benefited from Harmon Foundation scholarships, while others like painter Ed Clark, who is included in Americans in Paris, as well as Herbert, Herbert Gentry, studied with the assistance of the GI Bill. The ways traditional art historical narratives engage with the works of many Black American artists who came to prominence in the post-war period limits our full understanding of their time in Paris to a matter of biographical emphasis. But what if Paris, in this specific time and context, 
is not simply for artists an international foray or a convenient escape from the lived experience of anti-Black violence, but is also a pivotal geopolitical crossroads. It's strange in many senses from the dominant social art histories of the American avant-garde and the more uh, culturally specific civil rights era um, that's associated with protest art. Where do these black expatriate artists receive critical engagement, uh, which they often advocated for? Abstraction, as art historian Richard J. Powell states in his text, Black Art and Culture in the 20th Century, functioned for several Black as well as white artists as a passport into mainstream acceptance and was equally a vehicle through which artists could elude with material and or opacity their subjectivity as social and political beings. These elusive notions of existential humanity, existential Blackness, and their representation continue to reverberate in present cultural and art historical discourses seeking to contextualize Black abstraction. Through an exploration of converging Black 20th century abstract modalities, alongside the emergence of existential philosophies in post-war Paris, my hope for this roundtable is that together we will expand the scope and multiplicity of investigations of Black artistic practice from the 20th century and beyond. And now I'd like to take a moment to introduce our participants for this evening. Lewis R. Gordon is an Afro-Jewish public intellectual, academic, and musician. Alongside his teaching at UConn, he lectures and is involved in political and artistic projects across the globe and holds appointments in South Africa, Jamaica, India, and France. He is the author of many books, including most recently, Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization, Fear of Black Consciousness, Black Existentialism and Decolonizing Knowledge, writings of Lewis R. Gordon, he also serves as the editor of the American Philosophical Association blog series, Black Issues in Philosophy with Jane Anna Gordon and the book series, Global Critical Caribbean Thought also with, oh, sorry. And also with uh, Jane Anna Gordon, the journal Philosophy and Global Affairs. His accolades include the 2022 Eminent Scholar Award from the Global Development Studies Division of the International Studies Association. Please join me in welcoming Lewis R. Gordon. Next, we have Eric Kessel, who is an assistant professor of art history at the Institute of Fine Arts. As a scholar of contemporary art and critical Black studies, Kessel conducts research and teaching committed to tracing how racial violence has fundamentally shaped the conceptual and historical contours of our present understandings of the visual. He approaches works of art, popular media, and social phenomena as they refract the conditions of their intimacy with anti-Blackness and the hydraulics of the capitalist world system. In addition to his focus on the history and theory of art and media since the 1970s, Kessel's work derives from an interdisciplinary range of interests spanning slavery, Marxist and post-Marxist critiques of political economy, embodiment, philosophies of vision, and the subject and psychoanalysis and affect. Please join me in welcoming Eric Kessel. Darla Megan is a philo philosopher and art critic and part-time lecturer at the New School Parsons. She's an art critic and philosopher based in New York City. Her research takes up an interdisciplinary approach to the study of ethics and aesthetics, wherein to do with philosophy also means the learning, excuse me, also means learning from artists. She has written gallery essays in support of artists in Berlin, Kampala, New York, and San Francisco, lectured on visual culture at the American Society for Aesthetics, and published reviews on group shows, as well as solo ex exhibitions by Faith Ringgold, Abigail DeVille, Wangechi Mutu, and Akeem Smith. She is an alumnus of the Independent Study Program at the Whitney Museum of American Art, a lecturer at Parsons School of Design, 
and a contributor to Art Forum, Art in America, Artnet News, The Brooklyn Rail, Culture, Cultured Mag, Momus, Spike Art Magazine, Sugarcane Magazine, and Tech Circles. Please join me in welcoming Darling again. And last but not least, we have Denise Merrill, who is currently the Merrill H. and James S. Tisch Curator at Large at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Denise Merrill is an art historian and curator at the Met since 2020. As the Merrill H. and James S. Tisch Curator, she curated the groundbreaking exhibition, The Harlem Renaissance and Transatlantic Modern Modernism on view from February 25th through July 28th. She previously curated the exhibition Posing Modernity, The Black Model from Manet and Matisse to Today at Columbia's Wallach Art Gallery in New York and authored its catalog, and authored its catalog as the Wallach Support Foundation postdoctoral -doc research scholar. She was a co-curator of the exhibition's expansion at Musée d'Orsay, which was titled The Black Model from Jerry Code to Ms. Matisse, and a guest lecturer for its final tour as the Black Model from Jericho to Picasso at the Memorial Act in Pointe à Pitre, Guadeloupe. Merrill has taught art history at Columbia University and in Paris and has given public lectures and published as a guest essayist for numerous museums and universities. Without further ado, please welcome Denise Merrill. Everyone, thank you for being here today. Okay. <laughs> so I wanted to start off in the booth. Can you hear me okay with the microphone here? I wanted to start us off by thinking a little bit about double consciousness as for me, and I think for many people, whether they are studying art history or not, it is the first introduction to some kind of existential um, discourse around identity. Um, and so I want to ask for, for anyone um, here, uh, what double consciousness evokes for you in terms of 20th century Black artistic production and specifically uh, how W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, concept of double consciousness um, had an impact not only on Black Americans, but also um, Black artists uh, during this period. I'd be happy to start because we thought so much about uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, as most of us in the Anglophone world say, but I certainly understand that the uh, uh, the Francophone pronunciation would be Du Bois. It's <laughs> my, my French training. I can't get away with it no matter what. I did the same thing and I got corrected a <laughs> lot. <laughs> stateside, stateside. Uh, but uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, in his um, uh, uh, book 1909, I believe it was, Souls of Black Folks, sets forth this idea. He attempts to theorize uh, the African-American, uh, and I, I say the, I, I could say uh, a, uh, an African-American psyche as characterized by this notion of the double consciousness, uh, this sense of uh, always struggling uh, to uh, to determine one's own mode of self-expression, self-presentation, uh, to have uh, uh, striving for an autonomous um, uh, uh, mode of Black self-expression, but always aware of the uh, constraints of this external gaze, uh, this racialized external gaze in the context of American society uh, that, that was all about imposing limits, constraints, uh, and imposing uh, flat uh, stereotypes as opposed to allowing the full complexity of this uh, psyche to emerge. And this um, uh, philosophical approach 
was debated at the time. There were those who felt that it was perhaps overly concerned with this external gaze as opposed to focusing solely on uh, the uh, an, an autonomous mode, developing an autonomous mode of Black self-expression. You know, uh, Langston Hughes, for example, said, you know, um, we, the African-American artists, the new, the younger generation of artists, are going to uh, determine how we are going to present ourselves. Uh, and if white people like it, this is a direct quote, uh, that's fine. If they don't, that's okay too. If colored people like it, that's fine. But if they don't like it, that's okay too. We will go to the mountaintop, pr uh, proud, uh, fearless, and proud uh, of our own uh, individu individuality. So you had this kind of dual um, uh, approach to thinking about how uh, the individual African American and African American culture and society as a whole. Uh, presented itself both within the community and to the wider world. And so uh, a good bit of the uh, uh, literary production uh, as well as artistic, um, the visualization of the new Negro, uh, uh, the uh, term coined or related to uh, African-American art by, w by uh, Alain Locke, uh, was in some ways a response, a reaction, an elaboration uh, on what Du Bois had said uh, a decade or so earlier. And it, so he, it, this was a fount uh, from which the various streams, the various rivers uh, of uh, Black artistic and uh, literary, and to some extent musical thinking unfolded in the decades from the 19 teens through the late 1940s. Yeah, that, that's a great point that you make about presentation. Um, and I think as well, the idea of double consciousness or, or that specific phrasing sort of opens up an existential query about what it means to not only present as a Black American person, um, but also is an understanding of one's identity, right? And so I'm thinking about one's one's blackness, right, as not um, a unified identity is is essentially what he's arguing. But because of this sort of duality, there is a sort of fracture that that is occurring and that's being navigated always. And there's many ways, um, as you mentioned, throughout the 30s. And, and for throughout the early 19th century, 20th century, sorry, that artists begin to explore this idea. And one example that I have here, of course, there are many, is a self-portrait by uh, Malvin Gray Johnson um, from 1934. So almost three decades after, um, Du Bois is, you know, positing this sort of theory of double consciousness. Um, and throughout the Harlem Renaissance, as you mentioned, there's many sort of iterations um, specifically within the aesthetic realm that come to maybe one could say, represent or transpose this idea of um, double consciousness onto um, onto the visual and representation. Would you mind going back to the slide with sure Du Bois? I think there's something really beautiful about mispronouncing, maybe the mispronunciation, or it makes me wonder when that pronunciation was settled upon because Du Bois himself is particularly Europeanized. What we might think of as someone who's interested in joining the romantic tradition sees Black folks as part of the romantic tradition or having um, a racial calling, we might say. So it it strikes me that there is something particularly sweet about like referring to him as Du Bois because he also yes. embodies or takes on a certain level of um, seeing himself moving through Europe, like being educated in Europe, being, um, I, yeah, I'll use the term Europeanized, we can discuss what that means. But I, I'm i curious to know if anyone on this very illustrious yeah. panel happens to know when that sure. pronunciation was 
settled oh, upon? Oh, no, no. Um, well, there's several things. First, um, uh, Shalom, Salam Aleikum, uh, Saubona, which means I see you, and this is Zulu, and Jijuich, Chow, and just good evening to all of you. Uh, the first thing is the boys, that's how it's pronounced now, is of Haitian descent. Mm. Okay, so it was the boy. Okay. And what uh, it's a complicated story in terms of his father's family's uh, migration from Haiti uh, and ended, how they ended up in Massachusetts. The thing was that over the years, the it's just like, you know, in the United States, it's very funny, right? If you speak French, you say Illinois. But they'll say Illinois, right? So it, there, there are all of these things going on. But the thing about it is uh, the, the boys began to stick. And the, so the family uh, just continued that day. And so, but but it was uh, a correctly the boy, uh, you know? And, uh, but there's several things uh, I'd like to just say right away, right? When the boys raised the question of double consciousness, double consciousness was actually being discussed quite a bit before in the 19th century because of uh, a variety of things uh, in terms of particularly uh, phenomenological work, which basically deals with consciousness. And there were, there were already questions about the, the formation of the self. And it will take a while to talk about those from Hegel to Nietzsche to all these people. And the, bo the boys was familiar with them. However, Du Bois was bringing some two, a twofold task to it that actually connects beautifully to, to the exhibit, okay? The twofold task was basically first as a social scientist, because Du Bois, for instance, is one of the people who invented American sociology, but it's actually uh, not been acknowledged until very recently. But within the sociological framework, he had written a series of papers on the question of what, um, what he calls a study of the Negro problems, okay? And you'll see it in Souls of Black Folk when he opens up early on, where he says, how does it feel to be a problem? You see, and to give you a sense of it, it was not just uh, Du Bois doing this, but there were others who were later bringing this up. I, I'll tell you very quickly through a story of Richard Wright, for instance, because as the story is told, uh, quite often when we say African-Americans in Paris, uh, a lot of the narratives are almost as if African-Americans are going to receive a form of finishing, so to speak, in Paris. But what's not realized is that a lot of people in Paris were studying the intellectual production, artistic production of African-Americans. And so it's actually a two-way flow. And you could see this exemplified beautifully in someone like Richard Wright. Because when Richard Wright uh, greeted Jean-Paul Sartre uh, this, a few decades later, Sartre said, could you tell me about the black problem? And Richard Wright turned to him and said, black problem? No black problem in the United States, there's a white problem. And at that point, Sartre began to saw, oh yes, the issue is not a Jewish problem in Europe. It's an anti-Semites problem. Now, if we back up, this comes through beautifully from Du Bois because Du Bois basically did very important, um, if, you may, if you notice the souls of black folk, it's not only a critical social theoretical work, it's an aesthetic form of production. It's a beautifully written text that challenges the, the boundaries of disciplines. So he's simultaneously writing as a philosopher, a sociologist, an artist, et cetera. By raising them rhetorically, how does it feel to be a problem? He already uh, challenged a presupposition that there's no legitimacy to the inner life of African-Americans, okay? In other words, the presupposition was that black people are pure externality. Okay, so right away, he raised a very important critical question, and that is this. Uh, if you are constructed as a problem, then you're always seeing your eyes through the people who make you into a problem. 
And that becomes then the normative position, the gaze, as we could say, where you are conscious of how others are conscious of you. However, if you are able to have a critique of it, then you can ask about the problem of being made into a problem. And that double move, he was raising the question of a critical black consciousness in the text. But the thing with double consciousness that is also um, additional, so to speak, is that uh, it raises an additional question that the society did not want to deal with, and it connects to artistic production in a beautiful way, which is the humanity of Black people. Because you see, if you are made into a problem, you're a thing. But if you are understood as human beings who face problems, then one has to question the society that does that. This brings us to an additional element. And I think it really is striking how it, it, it's, it's shown in the works, which is it raises a very interesting question about how one thinks about art. Yeah, I think we should definitely keep that in mind and hold on to it, especially as we think about, you know, some of the more um, tangible processes that Du Bois was interested in enacting and fulfilling for Black Americans and, and specifically thinking about progress, right? A, a part of this drive to understand one's own consciousness, right, was to be able to subvert the oppressive perception of being a problem. Um, and in a way, I, I almost see that as his way or his conception of a attaining some kind of universalist viewpoint, right, which is one of the central sort of tenets of, of existentialism. If you think about uh, writers like Jean-Paul Sartre, right, as a sort of benchmark. Sure. Um, and progress comes into play here, especially um, as you both mentioned in the new, what is called the new Negro mm -hmm. movement and, you know, better known as the Harlem Renaissance, which was actually um, as we see in Denise Murrell's exhibition, much more global and transnational in not only production, but in its impact um, and how the development of some or the striving towards a racial idiom or the rejection of a racial idiom for some artists fulfilled um, a promise of racial progress. Can I yes, add that please. um Du Bois um exhibits some statistical diagrams in Paris at the Universal Exposition? And I'm gonna flub the year, but you should look it up if you're watching over Zoom. What'd you say? 1900. Thank you. 1900. 1900. Um, which interestingly kind of relate to abstract art mm -hmm. going on throughout the 20th century, but especially in the beginning um in Europe. Um and interestingly, he uses these abstract diagrams in order to not only like um, consider Black progress in the United States through his sociological research in Atlanta, um, but also to represent these statistics through a kind of universalist paradigm. So I just wanted to add that given um, that your question was about Du Bois's relation to the century abstraction. That's a really great point. Um, and it's very... If, if you haven't seen those uh, statistical graphs, I, I suppose you could call them, um, they're really great examples of his translation of um, what you referred to as a sort of oratory tradition, right? Which is in itself a sort of um, abstraction or kind of hybrid production um, coming out of the black vernacular culture. Um, but he then translates that also using color specifically, I think is important to note, um, to communicate that information uh, to his audience through the lens of, of color and abstract design. 
Um, it's one of the things that really drew me to art to think about what a scientific possibility for abstraction might look like, right? So the promise of being able to communicate with others who are not familiar with our life worlds, right? So the possibility of having these, they're beautiful diagrams. There's a recent exhibition of them. And then to think that poetry or art could actually do the same thing that scientific discourse does, the hope or the promise that we might be able to reach beyond our own inner world and and communicate with others and so I will never get past a voice because like this is mm -hmm. we won't even get to 1942 right <laughs> but I wonder I think about the criteria for Negro art I feel like it has to get put on the table right so Absolutely. 1926 right so where we have you know this the the existential we want to go ahead and call it an existential problem of seeing oneself outside of oneself or how one is seen or objectified then then we have maybe possibly a new question raised in the criteria for Negro art, which is, am I responsible to my race in terms of how I promote the aesthetic production of a culture? And now propaganda is on the table, right? So are we in the situation where we're being encouraged to be ourselves? Or are we focused for primarily on moving the race forward, which will require you know, all kinds of conversation between uh, the thinkers, well, primarily, you know, Alan Locke and Du Bois, but when the artists start getting involved, Langston Hughes, North, Zora Neale Hurston, right, now it's no longer the objective quality of present presenting ourselves for the purposes of political progress, but it is about, to my mind, an existential question about my life and the priorities of my life. I, I I should, um, since we brought up existentialism, at least offer uh, just a brief working definition of it. Thank you. Um, that is a great, <laughs> great idea. Because there are a lot of people, you know, there, there, there are a lot of people who talk about existentialism in many ways. Uh, uh, usually, um, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm exemplifying the stereotype right now because I'm wearing a black turtleneck. Yes. Yeah. But no, um, I totally did not but, use that. So you know, um, you know, I just don't have the beret and, and the bombs. <laughs> but but they but they actually, I teach a course called Global Existentialism that looks at existential literature from four thousand years ago in Africa, all the way through various traditions. Okay, so there's some basic things that you could think about to be able to to look at something in terms of an existential analysis. Okay, uh, the 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 first one is that uh, an existential analysis, right, basically uh, is premised upon the question of what does it mean to be a human being? It starts, it, it, all of all existentialisms take seriously the human condition. And you notice I said condition, I didn't say nature. So that's the second one. All existentialisms reject the notion there's human nature. And the reason they reject the notion there's a human nature but a human condition is what all existentialisms culminate in a discussion of freedom. Freedom is fundamental for existentialism. And the thing about it is that not only is the question of freedom about possibility, but then the intimate link between being a human being and the question of freedom leads to another element in all existential analyses which is existential anal analyses take the notion of freedom and responsibility as one. So they argue that, all existentialists argue that even if you achieve, say, liberation, right, you get rid of an oppressor. Existentialists would argue that doesn't mean you're free. Because all that does is now make you, put you on the road to struggling for the question of freedom. And they culminate often with the question of asking, what is a livable life, All right? So it gets into the question of what's the meaning of life. Now, one thing that's crucial that links through, we already see this, Black folks got a good, uh, got a good reason to think about freedom, right? Especially when we think about the history of enslavement. Second, enslavement tries to tell some people their property, they're not human beings. So clearly the question of, well, what is a human being is crucial. But there is another thing that comes through that's rather interesting. And, and I'll just think, I'm going to give a, a short version. 
The first one is about experience and the other one is about actually art. The experience part is very straightforward. Everybody in this room has had the experience of trying to figure out their experience. Am, am I wrong with that? And you ever notice when something happens, you're like, yo, what just happened? You never sit by yourself and go, hmm. You find someone with whom to talk about it to bring intelligibility and meaning to the experience. Now, why this is crucial and goes back to the double consciousness argument is that what under a situation of colonialism and anti-Black racism happens is the notion that the only legitimate source of theory and intelligibility to an experience has to come from something other than Black people. Now, that means then the presumption is that you apply what's called the white world to bring me intelligibility to what people call the Black world. But the problem that happens, and some Black folks respond and say, well, okay, forget that theory. I'm just going to deal with my experience. But the problem is, you see, those people who create their theory are bringing their theory from their experience. So ultimately, if you're going to take the question of the relationship of experience to theory seriously, everyone has to take responsibility for bringing the meaning into the experience. Otherwise, you're going to say some people's experience is more legitimate than others. But the art part comes in a very interesting way because all existentialists also take, everyone I've ever read, mm -hmm. takes seriously this question. It's a very different view of art than the, more, than the models that try to close, formalize, and stratify art. Because you see, art from an existential analysis is actually not a side dish or a garnish to life. Art is a central condition of human reality. In other words, we cannot live outside of the human world and the human world is a world of meaning that is affectively produced. And this links into something that uh, my colleagues could talk more about. Because I have a lot to say there, but yeah. I don't know how to panel. Let's take a minute and think a little bit about the realm of experience, right? And I'm thinking about specifically how experience is, as you mentioned, intellectualized in the specific context of um, the origins of the discipline or the sort of sub-discipline of African-American art history. Um, as we, we mentioned Alan Locke earlier um, in his writings on art in the 1920s and his, his work or his contribution to the subdiscipline was vital. And I find it, I always found it very fascinating that within the larger art historical discourse, it isn't acknowledged as often that his background is as a philosopher and not only as just like, you know, a philosopher, but a philosopher specifically concerned with race and racialization. Um, and so that's something that is, is also important to think about um, not only concerning Du Bois, but um, other central figures in the development of uh, art history, as well as artists like Aaron Douglas, um, who I've included some of his covers of popular magazines, uh, some produced by uh, the NAACP and edited uh, by Du Bois, um, as well as uh, my favorite is uh, Fire, which was a very, very short, um, publication project that uh, was a collaboration between Langston Hughes, um, Zora Neale Hurston, um, that translated a lot of their experience navigating this sort of like Harlem Renaissance that is so romanticized, but also thinking about this idea of double consciousness, the desire to um, fully embody the subject position of the artist, which they saw as having complete freedom to 
um, create work outside of the realm of respectability um, while also navigating the terrain of patronage and how that influenced um, artists of the Harlem Renaissance as well. And, and Douglas wrote a lot about how he felt um, about the role of specifically the Black artist and a lot of his positions as um, we'll see mirrored in Du Bois's writings from the 20s was that art should be propaganda. Um, and yeah. that was not limited to to Douglas, but to, to many artists. Mm -hmm. Dr. Morrell, I just, it occurs to me that the beginning, so we're talking about experience, we're talking about intelligibility, but it occurs to me that you began the Harlem Renaissance and Transatlantic Modernism exhibition with a, a, a glass plate, um, a vitrine that shows a poem by Langston Hughes illustrated by Jacob Lawrence. And that poem, so you're welcome, you know, uh, arriving on Fifth Avenue, also, you know, grand, you know, palais of, of the, Met, the Metropolitan Museum, and then entering into the exhibition and carrying it, you know, having the experience of reading about lynching immediately upon beginning that exhibition was really moving to me because all of a sudden, as we try to elevate the idea of black art, this is the height of the lynching era. So to the, to the you know, point to experience or versions of experience that we might want to hypothetically you know, imagine, we, we can't begin to imagine this time period, especially so, um, but then I'm struck at the same time by how, just how crisp the um, the graphics are for these magazines, right? So a certain level of, I, I you know, I'm finding myself straying further away from setting up something like a um, dichotomy between respectability and freedom. Um, something more interesting is happening there, it seems to me, to be able to sit and make art to experience the world knowing the horrors that are happening around you and come up with productions that still to this day, a hundred years later, still feel like freedom to me, or give me the sensation that other things or other worlds are possible. Would you speak to just the organization of um, opening the exhibition or how you were thinking about positioning the Harlem Renaissance? Yes, well, well, thank you. I I, uh, I appreciate that uh, perspective on the the experience of entering the exhibition. Uh, I felt very strongly that I wanted to root um, the um, the uh, eleven different galleries. You know, to, uh, to as I wanted to have this prelude that pointed out that the art that we we're seeing for, and we're going to be seeing was rooted in an intellectual uh, discussion. Uh, there was a set of ideas. Uh, there was a cohort who uh, uh, exchanged ideas. Uh, the you know studio uh, uh, three hundred nine. Florin, I always forget the number, but the uh, the studio where Charles Alston and and Jacob Lawrence and others um, had open studios. Um, artists came, but Du Bois came. Uh, Alain Locke came. Uh, musicians came as well. Duke Ellington. Uh, it would sometimes be an after hour spot for performers in in Harlem. This was on West One Hundred Forty First Street. And I wanted to uh, establish that there was discourse between the artists and the writers, and uh, that the artists were often working in concert with the writers to provide a visual uh, manifestation, a visual representation of these ideas, autonomous black self-expression, uh, the evocation of the ancestral legacy of African art, but also being fluent in the visual uh, vocabulary of international modernism. This was uh, an early moment when the African American uh, 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 positioned uh, African American uh, thinking and culture positioned itself as being definitely American, but also uh, uh, part of the wider Atlantic world. Uh, uh, du Bois was very engaged with establishing 
pan-African alliances together with Black French, Black British, Black Dutch, and other writers and thinkers. So I wanted to say up front that this thinking, this rigorous analysis, uh, this discourse, this exchange uh, between writers, as well as between writers and artists, was the foundation on which the visual production uh, unfolded. Uh, and, and there was, you know, there was some push, there, there was a debate internally to, there was a sense that you go with the most popular images, uh, which in many ways, if you think about the broader popular culture, fall down to some measure, some aspect of performance. It's the black person, you know, presenting oneself for the enjoyment uh, and you know, get uh, us you know titillation in mm -hmm. many cases of uh, the wider audience, predominantly white. And I wanted performance to be it's essential, it's core to the movement. But I didn't want that to define the movement up front. I wanted to show how it too evolved from a very rigorous intellectual debate. So that opening gallery, the thinkers is how I wanted to frame the entire rest of the exhibition. Thank you. I, re I, I really feel encouraged because I often feel like I have to choose between we're back to double consciousness again, right? Something like being an academic or being someone who is speaking radically about the conditions mm -hmm. um, and to have one at least to begin to get the show and then have the gallery set up so that you're both in, you can't turn away from the fact of a certain kind of acculturation that might be represented in this room by people of higher education and have a poem by Langston Hughes on Lynch simultaneously happening two feet away. Um, and it really did set up a proposition for me that was like, okay, I can, I can be in both of these positions simultaneously. And in fact, these artists and writers and thinkers very much were. Yeah, I wanna reiterate um, what I think everyone has touched on is that the stakes were very high, right? Not only, you know, experientially, but I, I would also say maybe like psychosomatically very intense, like these artists, writers, philosophers, um, social scientists, whatever their position may be, were living through a moment of extreme trauma and also grappling with the generational trauma, right, of enslavement, hundreds of years of enslavement. And um, one of the ways that I just want to briefly touch on that artist um, translated that sort of connection or maybe in, in some context, uh, artists would describe it or philosophers uh, like Locke would describe it as the almost the, the separation between um, African-American culture and uh, West African cultures is through this sort of synthesis of um, what many people perceived as, you know, dominantly white Western modes of abstraction with the cultural uh, motifs, signs, et cetera, from West Africa. And you can see that here through the use of masks um, or mask-like um, abstractions to represent uh, individuals. Um, and Hale Woodruff and Louise Milo, Milo Jones both uh, studied and lived in, in Paris. Um, and so are part of this discourse around abstraction that is very often centered around artists like Picasso, right? Um, his sort of mining and extracting of West African and not even just West African, just indigenous, um, non-Western mass sculpture, et cetera, those forms into his work. Um, and I, this is very clearly something that black artists as well as white artists are invested in during this period. But um, I wanted to think about it more critically in terms of the origins of black art history and why this drive or motivation to um, seize an ancestral legacy beyond um, 
what was perceived as being derived as like African-American vernacular culture um, coming from oration or gospel um, dance and, and other forms. Um, what was the sort of longing, right? The maybe cultural longing or what was perceived to be missing um, that artists felt the need to return, um, whether that be, you know, formally or literally, literally in some cases to Africa. And I, I wanted to ask you, Eric, about this, because I know you've written a lot about, um, some of the archaeological discoveries that occurred much later, I think actually in the 90s, um, such as the uh, African burial ground and the subsequent monument that was um, erected there. Um, and how the absence or the lack of uh, concrete historical evidence of uh, racial and cultural um, genealogy may have influenced artists and, and theorists at this time. Definitely. Um, well, I guess I want to return to one word that you started off with, which was diaspora, um, particularly because diaspora is often theorized as a kind of dislocation um, of Black people from, well, not only Black people, but in general through the term, a dislocation of the people from a kind of native land. Um, and that also aligns with other um, elements of the thinking of how people exist in modernity, but also think about the Atlantic um, slave trade as a kind of rupture or as Dion Brandt would say, a tear in the world. Um, and so one way of maybe understanding painting like Jones's Le Catiche, for example, is precisely as trying to meditate on this dislocation, um, the fact that these Don and some gay masks are presented outside of their ritual and dance context, for example, um, is perhaps cluing us into a concern with an attempt to kind of not only meditate on, but potentially repair this dislocation. And so fixing a sign of cultural wealth, for example, and lock becomes a way of proposing a kind of stability um, to be able to know about people as human and modernity in a sense, corrects this dislocation. And so that's one of the ways that I think about the kind of desire to reach back and to locate um, kind of ancestral past or legacy, as Mark would say. There is, um, there's an additional thing that uh, we could also consider. Uh, what's striking to me when I, when I look at um, the artworks is uh, they all exemplify something that was considered indecent in American society, and that is dignity. In other words, Black people are not supposed to have dignity. So if we go back to that earlier discussion of uh, the double consciousness argument, uh, the argument is that there's an awareness that what is being constructed onto black people is false. You see, the actual black life is beautiful and full of all kinds of other things. But, but there's something also deeper because you see, uh, and Du Bois later wrote about this, particularly in his last autobiography of a soliloquy um, on my life in the last decade of the first century. Uh, double consciousness argument as a second movement that's called potential, right? The second movement is the critical movement. It, it moves into a critical consciousness that says that, the, that um, a lot of hegemonic society is built on a lie, you see? So it means then the purpose of art is to bring out what that lie is. And one of the interesting things is that, and this is where the existential part comes in, there's a twofold part. Um, a lie um, that that um, that many people may inherit is the lie that the universe cares about us. In other words, the universe, reality, multiverse, whatever you call it, can be perfectly fine without us. But there's a form of arrogance in imperial societies. <laughs> 
in supremacist societies that try to articulate their necessity. Now, what's interesting is that we're looking at art produced from people who are constantly told that they are expendable, that they're not necessary, yet within that hostile environment, the production of dignity is articulated. And that's the existential move, you see? So anyway, there's a lot more to be said in it, but I just wanted to put that on the table. Another question that also evolves out of that, that one is about what dignity actually means for these artists, right? Is dignity a political or an individual, essentially this sort of battle between the collective and the individual? And that's something that I think, especially in the mid-century becomes very, very clear within the um, abstract developments that artists are making. I wanna skip ahead a little bit. Um, before you do it, could you show that picture of uh, Delaney and Baldwin again, walking? That is... Yeah, see, that's dignity. <laughs> you could just look at them, <laughs> right? But even so, something that um, always really troubles me is that even in these years of his life that Delaney spent, uh, the last uh, 30 or so years of his life in, in Paris, um, one could question whether his dignity remained intact because of the uh, struggles that he faced there, not only financial struggles, but struggles with his mental health um, and a, a kind of, you know, solitude that despite the success of his work really influenced, you know, the outcome of his life in his final days. And so it it, it does really bring to mind that sort of dichotomy of, of dignity and this existential question of one's, you know, collective impact, importance versus, you know, the individual. Yeah, the existential thesis. This is why existentialists argue that it's not that you have something and you're fixed. They argue against the notion of an essence in human life. So freedom is an ongoing struggle. And so, yeah, it's not that you 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 permanently have dignity. It's something you have to keep working at. You see, and but anyway, the, you're tempting me. I mean, yeah. go, go with it. Go with it. Uh, so we started to think about whether in ways in which authenticity is still relevant to the conversation. So perhaps the openness of attaining or attempting to see oneself as authentic to oneself is a worthy project to continue despite the fact that authenticity is often used as a measure for um, decision, like uh, to, to distinguish between that falsity, that lie, right? In ways that one is already being lied upon by simply existing. It does seem the urge to reach towards authenticity, which I think we see most actively in the context of the, um, in the context of the black arts movement you might say something like reaching for a, a relationship to Africa that's based on blackness as not diasporic even necessarily, but one that's based on an African-American understanding of what it might mean to come from somewhere and to be authentically rooted. And at the same time, I'm worried too about this problem of essential essentializing authenticities, right? Now I'm just repeating my dissertation, but like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but essentializing, an idea of what it means to be an authentic human being. So then reincorporating the lie back into the question of freedom, right? Reincorporating the lie by virtue of saying, oh, am I authentic? Have I reached it yet? Am I, am I finally there, right? That might not be the kind of thing we're, that you mean when you say that we are in an incomplete, incomplete project, right? Of, of finding ourselves, of knowing who we are, which is a human question. And this is, yeah, it's really exciting for me to think about the ways that abstraction comes in to play here. So abstraction as active as it might be in the, you know, the visual experience of an, you know, a card paint is also a part of how we are constructed as we think about ourselves or attempt to think about ourselves as whole human beings. 
from wherever you might land, from whatever position you might be coming from. I'd like to pose a related question, um, which maybe your point will speak to. Um, it's this question of if, if your humanity as a Black person is abstract, right? If it needs to be grasped and reclaimed um, and identified, right? Then as a Black artist, how can one make an art that is not abstract? And I mean that not in the sense of, you know, the figurative or the representative, because we, we know now that, or understand uh, more fully how figurative images can themselves be abstract, but um, at its most, I guess, <laughs> to, you know, put it most directly, the existential question of, of Black art is, is in this question of the abstract and in this question of this sort of essential humanity. That's why I just really quickly, this is why I love the, the Beaufort Delaney piece with a uh, figure that is you know, shown in many colors. It really mm -hmm. struck me immediately as soon as I walked into that gallery. And that is a portrait of, of Baldwin, is it not? Uh, the In the Harlem in Renaissance the show. Rapture. Is that the one you were talking about? I'm I'm not sure what the title is. You were you referring to, at, to the colorful, yes, the like, very large scale um Delaney portrait. Yes. Yeah. That is uh Dark Rapture. Yes. The Her, yeah, Dark uh, Rapture. The nude, the abstract uh nude. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing I was gonna say, and going back to this notion of dignity uh and you know, where on the continuum is that we're on the continuum of abstract, abstraction does that lead the visual artist? Um, I think one thing that was important to a lot of these um, artists was the idea of interiority, uh, maintaining uh, an aspect of inscrutability that, uh, that, that was a manifestation of one's freedom one's ability to control how one will present oneself to the external world and how much of oneself will uh, be made available, which is the exact opposite of the notion that if the body is owned by someone else, then you have no privacy, you have no interiority, you are constantly on display, uh, vulnerable to being displayed uh, not nude, but naked, stripped, okay? So, uh, and that manifested itself in figural art with a uh, an inclination not to present the black visage, the face, the body uh, in performative modes, uh, not smiling, not stirring or hostile, but just engaging the viewer on exactly the same basis that the viewer uh, uh, directs the gaze at. Mm -hmm. It's a way of de-objectifying and establishing a subject position. And when you think about you know, the, the breakdown of the naturalistic proportions of the body and ultimately the move away from feeling that art needs to represent some observed reality. Uh, abstraction is a def the definition of not uh, representing observed reality. I, I think that is an aspect of, it's, it's an exploration of the idea of interiority mm -hmm. that uh, one, and, and one that is rooted in African um, sculpture and uh, mask, the, the disproportionate, uh, the, the lack of fidelity to naturalistic body proportions, the emphasis on the face, on the head and the hands as the thinking and the doing part of the human, uh, of, the, of, uh, of, of being. Um, these were ideas that I think helped artists both in figural work and in work that was non-figural, that was you know completely abstract or a representation of objects, landscapes, cityscapes, et cetera. Uh, it was all about uh, freedom of expression, freedom of self-expression, freedom of choice as to how one wants to present oneself, 
uh, in opposition to a wider society that attempted to, that insisted on a specific definition that defined you uh, uh, through external uh, uh, notions. So interiority, I think, is a big part of this notion of dignity. And I think it is uh, it sets the artist on the path to be more abstract in the representation of the figure and to Alt to move toward ultimate abstraction, which is a representation of the mind, of the uh, of the spirit, of the emotional reaction to some idea or reality, without representing that reality uh, in a specific way. To the point of interiority and dignity, it's interesting that you brought us on the PowerPoint to the nineteen fifties, um, because Fanon's Black Skin White Mask comes out in the mid fifties as well. Um, and I kind of invite that into the conversation in a way as a complication of the terms of interiority or dignity, precisely because for Fanon, the issue was not only the attempt to produce a Black self-image, but the way that that self-image is preceded or interrupted or even usurped by what he calls an egophobic imago of culture. Um, and so that in a sense makes interiority for the Black or the Nekba for Fanon, a space that is not private, but actually <clears throat> driven by the same antagonisms that one finds outside of oneself. Um, and I wonder also then how that problem is something that we might use to think about abstraction in relation to representation and vision. Um, and maybe Delaney could give us yeah. there, perhaps, but um, yeah. yeah. I'm really... I'm really thinking about how we get from this position of uh, here I have it sort of contextualized with um, Sartre um, and also the first International Congress of Black Writers, which is in 1956 in Paris, which is really at the height of the time as we sort of define it in this exhibition of um, American artists, not only Black American artists, but American artists in general um, living in, in Paris. And so at this time, we have this really radical transformation that's happening really away from the eyes of the New York and like American art scene happening that would really change the, tra the trajectory of American abstraction. But at the same time, we also have this diasporic movement happening that is really rooted in not only existentialism, but the discourses and writings of negritude and um, also in its relation to surrealism. Um, and so that's something I'm thinking about here um, in terms of collaboration um, and how that sort of seeming separation might also help us to understand the the impetus the cultural impetus for these artists at this particular cultural moment to be using abstraction in such a dominant um a dominant way i think within this exhibition um one of the only artists who continues to work in both non-representational and figurative modes is Delaney. Um, and other artists really pretty starkly um, change their aesthetic language to uh, sort of pure abstraction um, with the exception maybe of uh, Barbara Chase Rabot. Um, There's something I... Uh... In addition to the room, the point I made about dignity that I see in a lot of the work. Uh, and that is also an, an additional element, which is the blues. Mm -hmm. Now, because we're at visual representation, we're not thinking about it. But it's interesting how much uh, even the sculptures uh, exemplify a blues sensibility. The thing about uh, the blues that many don't understand and this comes back to the point about dealing with reality, dealing with the contradictions, is that uh, bl blues is actually about uh, uh, dealing, I, 
I, ironically, with, with what people are trying to avoid. And it's one of the reasons why it 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 spread like wildfire. Even if there are people, it, it's I actually argue it's a leitmotif motif of what we call the modern age. And uh, and so, in a way, some many of the artists, I would argue, bring that uh, understanding uh, to the to the level of vis visual representation. Because remember, I one of the things about double consciousness, there's also a flip side. If you understand critical double consciousness and then potentiated double consciousness, what double consciousness is actually saying is that sometimes the key to a more universalizing practice comes from the particulars. In other words, the, the presupposition of being universal often makes one not see reality. You see, because one avoids one's particularity, but being able to live with one's particularity enables one to be open to others in such a way that expands our human relationships. And so at the level of abstraction, one of the things that's rather striking is how much it brings to the fore a fundamental incompleteness, right? Because it's not uh, setting up a kind of isomorphic notion of representation. When one looks at it, one's always having a sense that there is more, but it draws one in to engage it. And at the same time, you have a sense that there's something that is right before you that you're not seeing. In other words, the negation. Anyway, there's there's a lot more, more about it, but but it's there. And I would argue that it brings that question of blue sensibility into the work. And, you know, jazz earlier in uh, the 20th century and um, moving into the latter half of the century, blues um, and other forms of popular music would be extremely influential, influential to not only African-American artists, but as you mentioned uh, previously, many European artists, right? Um, and we don't have much time left before I would love to take some questions. Um, but I wanted to think just a little bit about this period of the transition between, you know, the 50s and the 60s, um, especially because it seems like, you know, this kind of unity or like universe, universality that you're evoking um, seemed to really fall apart in a lot of ways. It became very polarized, um, thinking specifically about um, artists like Frank Bowling um, and some of the discourses around Black modernism and what it meant to be um, a Black abstract artist at this time. We have, you know, work such as this um, um, that were, you could say more purely abstract in some ways, um, that is definitely not adequate language, but we also have works such as these that are more um, readily identified with the black arts movement, right? So there's very clear contrast um, in sort of these camps that arrive um, in a way that maybe didn't appear earlier in the, in the 20th century. Um, I would love to hear thoughts thoughts on that. If, if I feel like we would be remiss to not mention Faith Ringgold in this very moment. So oh, she in, is, like, she in so far definitely on my mind right now. Very much so. And rest in peace. I don't want to let her go with, I don't want to let her go at all. But, um, <laughs> but I do think of her as someone who understood quite deeply that there need not be a distinction between communication and abstraction, um, that she could be figurative and also remain open to the possibility for having the work be read on multiple, multiple, multiple layers. Um, so we have a reference to Picasso, right? We have also quilt, quilting tradition that is present here, but it's certainly, um because I recently, it was, I wrote about her know that the the quilt is a canvas right that's made to look like a quilt so she's speaking on the level of abstraction but also taking um you know enjoying taking her 
leisure, right? And taking advantage of the possibilities for figuration, right? And for, for dealing in multiple histories of visual culture, right? So we maybe more recently hear about cheese and quilters, but that has to, I have to think, I'd have to do some research to, to think about whether and how Faith Ringgold is already doing that work of synthesizing art histories that are at various levels of, of recognition, whether I, so sometimes I'm not even sure like what it means when we say or use the phrase, I don't tend to use it, African um, American art history, right? Other than saying that like there are particular um, figures or personalities who have been active in the context of making culture. But other than that, I really don't see any, like I don't want to make the distinction. I think of her as an American artist who is in no way um, sealed off between uh, being a figurative and an abstract artist. That also seems important just in relation to the bowling as well, that um, figuration of consonants is brought into this work, but also um, Who's Afraid of Barney Newman, 1968, um, which is a play on Newman's Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Blue. Um, we talked about this work in class two weeks ago. Um, but one of the things you were thinking about was kind of like the remix as one way of understanding what the relationship is between um, Bowling and Newman, but also what the inclusion of some kind of referentiality or figuration does to a certain modernist mode of reading abstraction as a kind of escape from figuration and a kind of like sovereign achievement. Mm -hmm. um, what becomes interesting and the inclusion of referentiality, but also even in the way that Ringgold paints Picasso into the frame, um, is one a kind of like desublimation maybe of a certain mode of reading abstraction. Um, it's almost like both Bowling and Ringgold are popping a balloon in a sense. <laughs> um, and there's something kind of playful, but then also I wanna say antagonistic um, yes. that they're mobilizing. And maybe that points to a broader way of thinking about that relationship between figuration and abstraction is like mostly um they're in the conversation in an antagonistic way like actually rivaling or challenging um let's say a certain like modern interpretation that is metonymic one could say for whiteness that is a big, very great point and i think um it's a great point to also get some questions from the audience. Um, so if anyone has questions, we're gonna have a mic coming around. Two questions at once. <laughs> Hi, I'm in the back corner over here. I'm Malika. Thank you all for such an insightful discussion. Okay, yeah, I'll stand up. <laughs> um, I don't want to block you. I had to put my question down on my phone, so sorry if I'm reading off. But regarding the diaspora in 19th century Paris, um, I've imagined throughout your research you have encountered people of African descent who are non-American um, and living in Paris around the same time and also having similar intellectual discussions, such as like Aimé Césaire and the Nadal sisters. Um, and so I'm just wondering, like, do you see their experiences as similar, considering that they're non-American? Because I feel like there was like a moment of obsession with the idea of American being attached to a person. Um, and then also, like, how do you all think they fit into this larger conversation of the diaspora within Paris? I'm just going to... Um repeat and I hope that I get both parts of your question the first part is about American identity and um whether there were artists um I'm assuming black artists from other places in the diaspora who were also practicing in Paris during this period of the mid-century and then the second part of your question was about it's like, sorry, see, it's just so long. Okay, hold on. Um, no, it's, it's okay. It's it's a little bit hard to to hear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Um, it's just about do you see those experiences as similar? And also, um, do you all like how do you all think they fit into the overarching conversation of the African diasporic identity in Paris during the nineteenth century? Yeah. 
Okay, great. So some of the similarities and differences observed between American artists and non artists of um, African diaspora. Um, would you like to start? Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, maybe this is it's not insider because we know we talked about this before. Hi. Um, but your question makes me think of Patrine Archer Straw's book *Negrophilia*. Um, in particular, in particular, how she surfaces the um, kind of philic fantasies that French people have about Black culture, especially around jazz and dance, and you said of Josephine Baker earlier. Um, and that maybe also is important to the more general perception of Americanness that follows um, Black Americans once they arrive in France after the World War II. Um, but also, I think think that um, someone like James Baldwin could be relevant insofar as he writes a number of times about encountering Algerian people in Paris and what the kind of relationship is between them as both racialized people within the metropole. Um, and that maybe seems relevant also to the history that's being charted through the exhibition, given that it ends in 1962 around the Algerian Revolution. I'd also point out just the sort of other contemporary discourses that are happening around this time related to the negritude poets and scholars who aren't directly addressed by the exhibition, but whose works are definitely in dialogue with uh, American writers like James Baldwin and Richard Wright, um, and whose experience of Paris and French generally definitely differs to the American experience in terms of the level of, I would say maybe romanticization that many American artists and writers um, sort of move through in their time living in Paris, going from this position of um, a seeming sort of beneficial experience of negrophilia to a sort of disillusionment with France's position as a um, co an oppressive colonial power, right? Um, but many of those artists from throughout the diaspora have uh, a lived experience and a knowledge of this because their, um, their home countries and territories are actively um, being colonized by the French or recently um, were, were decolonized. So it's a very different specter of experience, but um, I think it's safe to say those artists uh, did, they were influenced by each other. Um, as, as someone who, I mean, this period is really interesting to me because not, not even just for scholarly reasons, but for personal reasons. So right in this period of, I can't even say decolonization, let's say de-escalation, right, in a certain sense, uh, and, and the arrival of African and West, particularly West Indian and African immigrants to the United States, there then becomes, and I don't think it is by any accident, it is by design, a uh, contest between recognition of Black Americans and let's say newer Black Americans. Mm -hmm. And I'm no, I don't have any resolution here but it strikes me that the question goes even deep even deeper thank you for asking yeah. one thing i'd like to to add to it is that um, um everywhere we go at least and i've been all over the planet pe most people think their blacks are the blacks <laughs> and within that framework but but then there's a second part which is that um, the production of people into the category of Blacks are functions of uh, historical political forces that would make whoever is constructed that way, if they're at the biggest empire in town at the moment, will have the loudest voice. Uh, the period we're, we're referring to uh, is one in which we should take very seriously that um, and no moment is what we call Blacks, not part of a global unfolding set of events. And in the 19th century, the, the big conflict 
was was at first around the question of uh, basically Britain and France, okay? Because the, the, the Portuguese, Spanish Empire and the Scandinavian empires, they, they declined, okay? However, as the US began to rise, uh, there was also a, a global situation. Uh, if you look at the, for instance, the, the photograph from the, nine, the from the 1956 Black Writers Con Congress, pretty much eight tenths of the people there were communists. Okay, and it was just on just to the left. Okay, it was so much of a concern that the U.S. actually had blocked the boys from attending but also had selected certain people to attend. So the construction of the kind of uh, arts diplomat, so to speak, because William Fontaine was there, for instance, and uh, some people were there. Uh, one of the funny things from that meeting is there were two Amy Cezaires. <laughs> one was Amy Cezaire, and the other one, Baldwin talked about the young Amy Cezaire. Mm -hmm. The young one who is uh, to the left in the picture was Franz Fanon. And that's because so fat, so young is there with Espanol and you know six is there in the other part. But the but the thing is with within that 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 global framework, the each was negotiating the question of thinking about what what would what would the location be politically outside of the framework of those imperial structures. So we're we're talking about a period in which, as 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 French power was declining and British power is declining, American power is growing, and so with each of the others, what's interesting is a lot of them, like Sir Char, uh, George Lamming, who's right over there, uh, quite a few of the others went to were were moving through, through the UK, but a lot of them were mediating it with France, but France also had this other concept that was very very difficult. To deal with, and that is the concept of the republic. The concept of the republic was actually claiming to have no racialization, but it externalized it in its colonies. So there was a form of interesting performance going on that in meeting there was raising the question, not only of concerns in the US and other places, but also in France itself. So France thought in hosting it, right, it would represent a certain level of uh, being progressive. But what you'll find is that the very language, a lot of the discourses that even affected the African-Americans was actually uh, originating from the French world, moving through the Anglo world, and was coming back in a very interesting form. And this is something familiar because it, 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 it's well known. You know, Paul Gilroy wrote about this and others. Such a fascinating Super. image. Um, unfortunately, yeah. we are at time, but um, if there are any more questions, hopefully a few people can stick around um, at our reception. We invite you to join us um, for some drinks and snacks. And hopefully you can get some questions answered there if you haven't already. Thank you all so much.